So we've got 30 minutes. We've got a really big meaty, excuse the pun, topic in front of us, uh, genomics. Uh, let's kick things off. Uh, my name is Seth Waring. I'm the business manager of the Stabilizer Cattle Company. And if anybody's read the press this last week, you'll have seen that we launched our genomic EBV. So we thought it's a really good opportunity to get some experts in uh, and discuss what are EBVs, what, how do they work, and, and what role it can play in um, cattle breeding. So first up, uh, Lee, would you like to introduce yourself uh, and just give us a little bit of background on who you are and what you do? Certainly, Lee Leachman um, from Leachman Cattle of Colorado. We are a, a seed stock company based here in the United States out of the uh, city of Fort Collins in the center of Colorado, northern central Colorado. And uh, we market a couple thousand bulls a year, about 80% uh, of which are stabilizers. And uh, we've been working with the Stabilizer Cattle Company since its inception back in 1997 or so, I think. And uh, we're uh, very keen on measuring all the traits that can be measured on beef cattle that impact profitability, and then finding the cattle that best optimize that complicated trait set that we have that drives profitability on a suckler herd. Brilliant. Thank you, Lee. Uh, and also joining us this evening, we're very pleased to have Kent. Kent, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sure, Seth. Um, first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening. So my name is Kent Anderson. I serve as the Director of Technical Services for our Global Beef Genetics Group at Zoetis. So what that means is on one hand, I get to work with um, our R&D, our research and development group to build and improve and validate products. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I work with breeders like Lee and our uh, sales colleagues to help producers make best use of the, of the technology. Fantastic, thank you very much. Right, so look, we've got 30 minutes. Uh, we, we, we are gonna try and stick to the 30 minutes, so let's kick things off. So Lee, I think before we get into genomics, could you just give us a bit of a recap on, on EBVs and what do EBVs tell us? Yeah, the, the, um, the, the really kind of high level perspective on EBVs is we can look at cattle, we can weigh cattle, um, or we can look at what we really think is genetically driven in what we see. And an EBV separates out what we think is really genetic. In other words, that's what's going to be passed on if you use this bull or get calves out of that cow versus what is environment. All of us know that if you're a really good stockman, you can make an animal heavy and look good and be fat. But as my father said, when you take that animal home, you don't inherit the management of that farm. You only inherit the genetics. And the EBVs predict the genetics that you're going to inherit for the various traits. And they are the best tool we've ever had. In fact, I'd argue that the, the improvement of beef cattle on, on the variety of traits we have is nearly impossible without EBVs. Great, great. So, you know, for, for any beef breeders out there or for, for probably any animal breeders out there, EBVs have been used for a long time for selecting those animals that give us the, the best and desirable traits, which we're trying to express in our, our next generation. So Kent, can you just give us a, a very brief highlight on, on what genomics can add to that mix, please? Yeah, sure. So you all know that every sperm is different and every egg is different. And so every time that comes together to produce an offspring, we have a different uh, genetic makeup of the animal. In historic conventional genetic evaluation, we measured the phenotypes of the animals and the phenotypes of their progeny. And that enabled us to know whether the animal got a good average or bad sample of genetic material um, from its parents. Where genomics comes in is at 50,000 locations across the genetic makeup of the animal, we now have the genotype of the animal, and we can define that later if you like. And so we're really getting a direct indication of genes the animal possesses and, um, and a direct indication of how that animal is then genomically related beyond just uh, theoretical pedigree relationships so that we can then jumpstart that animal's accuracy and do all the better job of um, accurately predicting differences in genetic merit early in life. Fantastic. So it's a, it's, it's a tool that we can use that we can take a, uh, a DNA sample of that calf at birth. We can send it off, get it tested, 
and we can get results back on the breeding potential of that animal when it's only a few weeks old. Correct. And I think where the power comes in is, you know, by virtue of um, that DNA information and those genotypes, what we are doing is we're jump-starting the accuracy of the EBV. And um, compared to conventional evaluation, that jump-started accuracy is roughly equivalent to the better part of having a first calf crop for a sire that's evaluated as a young non-parent, or for cows that are tested, their EBVs achieve accuracy that otherwise would require probably two lifetimes of production to achieve. So what it boils down to then is we can make wiser selection and mating decisions throughout the animal's life. Perfect. Perfect. I've got some. I've got some details there. Would now be a good time just to bring up some examples of what what that looks like in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Let's right. let's talk about what we know best is that we all, if we come from multiple sib families, we know that uh, despite having the same sire and dam, uh, we all come out differently. Seth, this is a picture of your family. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, as you can see here, this is me and my two brothers, uh, and yep. Yeah, exactly the same parents, yet we all look very different. Uh, we all act very different and, you know, you probably think that I've got a better uh, better fat cover and a better feed efficiency, would you, Lee? Well, we don't know if your intake was high or if your efficiency was better. That's why we have to measure it. So, <laughs> so just a, a real world example. Also, we saw Ursula earlier on the uh, call and uh, we have got a... Um, oh. We've got Ursula's, Ursula's two sisters on here. And again, you know, I, I think that they're a nice picture, but what it highlights really well is actually, we can put the, and, and when we put it into cattle terms, we can have that same mating of, a, of the same animals over a hundred times, we can end up with a big, a big variation of uh, what the offspring are gonna look like. And, and really genetics is a, is a great thing. It, it is this variation that allows us to select, we're looking here at a uh, distribution of uh, the number and, and value for 365 day weights on male offspring of a bull called black resolution. And when we, when we use an animal, we always get a normal distribution. We kind of around the average, we get a peak and we get extremes. And um, that's a great thing because if they, if they were all lined up on one number, we could never make improvement. It's exactly by identifying the animals at the desirable end of that distribution that allows us to make progress. Of course, here we're looking at phenotypic differences and uh, what we want to distill out of these phenotypic differences. Obviously, there's an animal way up at the high end that had a, uh, a adjusted 365 day weight of over 700 kilograms, right? We want to know how much of that was genetic and how much of that was environmental. And so historically, we'd look at that weight and we'd say that's by far the best bull and we wouldn't really be able to factor out the environment. The EBV said, well, he was compared to a set of contemporaries. So what was his feeding environment and how much of what was expressed there was environmental versus, versus um, his genetics. And now, as, as Ken pointed out, we can also look and say, let's look at his genomic makeup and let's look back into the database and see what other animals have genomics similar to his and how did they perform? And so we use that to inform that decision and we get a much more accurate description of what an animal is. But of course, we know what black resolution is. He's now had a lot of progeny. Even though we know an animal's production, there's still this distribution around it. And, uh, and, and EBVs are predictions. We, we, we call them unbiased because when, when we have a low accuracy prediction, it could go up, it could go down right? Once a bull becomes highly, highly proven, we, we start to know exactly what that true breeding value is. Um, what genomics does is it lets us get a better prediction earlier of the true breeding value for those animals. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think a big part of that is, is when we are, when we're making those breed decisions, we look at a lot of numbers, don't we? And we, we see all these numbers and we see that for, for this black resolution bull, we expect his EBV to be here. Uh, we expect all of his progeny to be on this line. But of yep. course, we can get higher, we can get lower, and we still have this range. So, so how, does, how does genomics 
does genomics affect that range at all? Um, go ahead, Kent. Why don't you tackle that one? Well, genomics doesn't so much affect the range as it just helps us sort out the sampling, whether the animal got a good, bad, or average sample of the genetic material. So it helps tell us whether or not the EBV is on the left, middle, or right hand that uh, distribution of the progeny. And I think the, the secret sauce behind the scenes is that when we have those 50,000 genotypes that are helping to inform the relationships between animals. So in conventional evaluation, those relationships were based on pedigree information and theoretically genes the animals shared in common. When we have the genomic information, uh, we then know more specifically how animals are related to one another within and across herds. And it's that um, better, more accurate, precise relationship between animals that then drives us to higher accuracy predictions of those animals early in life. And so you can think beyond verification of the pedigree, the sire and the dam, this goes beyond that and truly extent to which animals share markers and then connected genes in common across the population. So a tested animal then has a better quantified relationship between its uh, siblings and its grandparents and all other animals in the population that have then uh, phenotypes informing its prediction. And, 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 that, and that database of you know, that you can compare against is that specific for a breed or is that of all cattle sharing the same genes that you're comparing against? Well, in the early days of genomic enhancement, yeah, we learned that the population was um, very important. And um, in order to really get good to connectedness, we need lots of animals in the population tested. And the beauty of the genetic evaluation, the multi-breed genetic evaluation that LCOC has enabled is that we've got uh, representative animals from uh, both straight breads and, and the very influential straight breads and genetically superior animals within the straight breads, as well as across uh, various hybrids. And so the evaluation is quite sophisticated in that it uh, accounts for heterosis effects. It accounts for what we know about those animals and their genetic merit in external evaluations. And then of course, what is the most important driver, of course, is um, the combination of all these phenotypes that are collected in big equal opportunity, competitive contemporary groups. And um, then layered in to that is the genomic and the pedigree information uh, that connects it all together. Yeah, so, oh, Ursula's just popped up. So I dare say first, if we see Ursula, it means we've got a question. Uh, Ursula, you, I'm to you. Hi, uh, we've got a question from, I hope I pronounced it right, Yann Ledoux. Uh, does genomics allow a better understanding of trait her heritability? Lee, you want me to take that or do you want it? Um, go ahead, Kent. I'll let you tackle that one. And then maybe we'll talk about uh, a couple of uh, full CB T bulls next. Go ahead. So as it relates to what we call genetic parameters and otherwise the heritability of the trait or the genetic correlations of the trait, you know, we have estimated those for the LCOC population and those um, inform the predictions. Where the genomics comes in is um, more in the way of um, sorting out sampling and adding accuracy to the prediction. So um, the genomic information doesn't necessarily um, impact heritability of the trait, but it impacts um, how the heritability is used to weight the phenotypic information in the evaluation and then remove the error and account for the connectedness of animals across the population. And, and I just add to that, that we do, it, it, when we think about heritability, a trait has a certain heritability, but with, before genomics, we would always assume that you got half the genes from your dam and half from your sire. And now with genomics, we find that animals, in fact, can get really skewed distributions. Kent said earlier that the sperm and the egg are different. So the reason that you don't look exactly like your brother, Seth, is that, is that when they sample those millions of genes that really affect what we're doing, 
you can get a funny roll of the of the dice, right? I mean, if you look at a at a normal die and you roll it, you know, you're going to get right in the middle on an average, but you never do. You might get double sixes, you might get double ones. You know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of variation there, and it is that variation that uh, is both our 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 struggle and our opportunity. It's our struggle because we'd like them all to be really uniform. And the reality is we'll never change the distribution of that curve. Even in these highly inbred lines of, of dairy cows, they still get that distribution. So this idea that I have a sire that, that, that throws less distribution, you really just haven't measured enough traits and had enough progeny to evaluate that because the truth is they all distribute the same. We can't really change that. Good thing we can't because as we improve in line breed, we still want that variation to find that outlier to make the population better. So that's, that's critical. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, um, the genomics gives us a hint of where the genes came from and whether they were good or bad. So we might talk about pledge. I don't know if you can yeah. put that up, yeah. Seth. I, my earliest experience with genomics goes back to a red Angus bull born in our system. He was a set of several ET brothers. His name was Leachman Pledge. And uh, he was born in 2012. So we're going back eight years now. And uh, we had he and his brothers tested on what Zoetis offered at that time, which was a genomic test for red Angus. It was a far less sophisticated models than we have today, Kent. But what it said was it said that this bull who had the lowest phenotype for 365 day weight, which is that AYW. He had the lowest phenotype, those are pounds. He weighed 851 pounds at yearling. His brothers weighed 981 and 1045. The data said that he was going to have the biggest ribeye by far and the most growth by far. Now today in, in our system and, and the Red Angus breed in general would have more data than we have, but we have several hundred progeny out of pledge, okay? He ranks in the top 1% of all bulls in the Red Angus breed on yearling growth rate. And he ranks in the top 5% on ribeye. So indeed that information projected correctly despite the fact that phenotypically he was on the edge of an animal that we should have culled. Okay, I would tell you today that if we didn't have the genomic information, we would have called it. Okay, and this happens. Kent, Kent's been through lots of this. When we have these full sibs, a lot of times the genomic says the best one is one that doesn't look the best. And then we pull our hair out, right, Kent? Because when it says, oh, that's the best one and he looks the best, we say, oh, it works really well. And we have the one that doesn't look like that, we scratch our head. So in our system here, we, we, there's a stabilizer bull we're using right now. He's one of about 25 brothers, okay? He's the second best, second worst phenotypically in terms of performance, okay? So if you just, if you didn't have the genomics, you say he's the worst one, forget him, we're gonna use the other ones, okay? At the other end with the genomics, it says he's the best bull, okay? So what we're learning in our system is we go ahead and sample those bulls. Now, you know, where is his true value? Time will tell, but what we know, what we know is that the genomics is more accurate than what we see. We know that, right? I mean, there's, there's really no way to dispute that, Kent, right? We know that, that EBVs with pedigree and performance are not as accurate as an EBV with no pedigree and performance than genomics. It's really astounding. And look, I, th I think that's a point we'll just touch on in a bit, Lee. But I think first up, you know, we've talked a lot about growth and we've talked about the, those easy to measure growth traits. And, and the reason that we talk about growth is everybody can put them through a push, they understand them. Now, is genomics li limited to those easy to measure traits? No, go ahead, Kent, and talk about that. No, I'll, I'll just uh, share that another benefit of genomics is that oftentimes there's difficult, time-consuming, and very expensive to measure traits in seed stock and commercial for which we don't have as many phenotypes as is ideally the case. So in the case of genomics, when we test an animal, not only does it enhance all the EPDs for which a given breeder is submitting phenotypes, but there may be some traits um, for which, for whatever reason, they didn't submit them. And in that case, the genomics can enable 
a prediction whereby otherwise there would be no prediction. So just kind of looking ahead, um, you know, difficult to measure things like reproduction or health traits, uh, whereas we may not have a historically large database of those. As long as we have a good solid reference clean database from which to inform the marker effects, we can produce a prediction whereby otherwise it would not have been possible. And, and you know, it's, it's like, like we all, we're all used to looking at milk EBVs on bulls, Seth. And, and a milk EBV historically was just the average of the sire and the dam. And now with genomics, when we get these milk EBVs back, we find that they're not average. We, we know that this one's gonna milk more, that one's gonna milk less. And, and there's a prime example where we can't observe the, the trait on the individual, but the genomics tells us how that's gonna go. And uh, you know that obviously has worked in dairy exceptionally well, milk's their primary trait, used to take years to prove those sires out. Now, literally the day, you know, within 60 days of birth, they have a better prediction on that animal than they used to have three years into his life. So it's amazing. It's amazing technology. Yeah. So Ursula's popped up. Have we got another question, Ursula? We have, we have indeed. Hi, Jim, Jim Logan from the Borders. Uh, question is, are genomics going to give us greater accuracy for low heritability traits, i.e. longevity, fertility, et cetera, and if so, is this likely to improve over time? Yeah, the first answer is yes. Um, it is going to give us better predictions. Um, and is it likely to improve over time? I mean, can you might just give just a brief history of how genomics technology has evolved? And uh, obviously, we with all technologies, we can expect the evolution of technology to continue. So. Yeah, go ahead, Kent. Yeah, so just a little background. Um, back in, say, the early 90s, we only had a handful of markers that predicted a handful of traits. Uh, tenderness and things like that, uh, where they had major gene effects, were probably the first to come to mind. But um, what's happened in the evolution is it's gotten cheaper and cheaper and more efficient to do what we call high density genotyping. So rather than just having a few markers, now when we genotype an animal, we get 50,000 plus markers. And what that means is for each one of those markers, we get a result that says whether or not animals have two A copies of the marker, an A and a B copy of the marker, or two B copies of the marker. So we have a lot of um, coverage, if you will, of the genome of the animal. And that's what um, is really enabling us to more specifically quantify relationships between animals and then their genetic merit. Lee, looking to the future, you know, I would anticipate that the genotyping platforms will continue to expand um, and we'll get some improvement in accuracy over time because of that. There's even already talk of um, imputing genotypes to complete sequence DNA sequence of the animal that might be in the future down the road a little bit further. But since we have a lot of breeders in the audience, I would still emphasize that your phenotypes are perhaps more important today than ever before. So good birth, weaning, yearling, scan, uh, dry matter intake, uh, teat and utter score records, mature cow weights. Um, it is still the phenotypes that's going to inform the prediction and is going to synergize with uh, the genotypes to enhance accuracy in the future. And look, I think, I think that's a very common question that we get asked is now we're going down the genotype in animals. Does that mean we have to stop, we can stop measuring? And the short answer is a no, is it? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, if, if you just think about the DNA in those simple terms, we look at an animal's DNA, we look back in the database and say, who has DNA like that? Nobody has DNA like that. It doesn't work very well. And then if they have, if we have DNA like that, do we have measurements for the traits we want to study on those animals that have similar DNA? Again, if the answer is no, the database is not useful. So the, the, the strength of this, of this relationship that we have is that, you know, we have populations of stabilizers in North America and Australasia and in the UK that are highly related. We're all turning in what by, by breed association standards or historical standards is very complete phenotypic information across those animals. 
And then we're genotyping a very high percentage of them. And so those things help so that when you get an offspring, you look at that animal and say, do we have an animal related to this in the database? Yes. Do we have measurements on all those traits? In many cases, yes. And, and then it projects that quite accurately. And so we're very much about um, as a system with Stabilizer Cattle Company and Leachman's and, and the other breeders that are contributing into the database that Zoetis analyzes, we're trying to get the most complete and most accurate phenotypic data to go along with the genomics. And then the great thing that Zoetis brings to the table is the most sophisticated genomic analyses that we can apply to that. And it's really the marriage of that database and that analysis with these different technologies that gives us the power that the system has today. Fantastic. Now, I'm conscious we've just Seth? We've got three minutes left. So, sorry, Ken, carry on. No, I was just going to respond a little bit more to Earth's, Ursula's specific question. Genomics does come in real handy on the lowly heritable traits. So in dairy, we do predictions for cow and calf wellness. And even in the LCOC, we've been um, prototyping predictions for stayability, uh, measure of sustained reproduction. All those are more in the 0.1 level of heritability. What that means is an animal's individual record contributes relatively little to its genetic prediction. And that's where genomics comes in and it can really help us with those lowly heritable traits, um, especially those that are of extreme economic relevance and importance. So for, for us that have just started this journey, we've got our first lot of, of genomic measures available to us. As we go forward, it's only gonna improve, it's gonna get better we're gonna see more accuracy and we're gonna see more traits getting measured. Now, we've just had two questions come in. Very good questions. They are, and, and Ursula, could you ask kind of group them both together because they're both very similar, aren't they? Right, yeah, no, well, I'll just, I'll ask the most questions of the two people. One's Russell Allison from Lanarkshire. Hi, Russell. Uh, will it be possible for genomic testing of F1 heifer calves where the dam is across and from unknown population? I think it's a great question because I know Lee will have some great answer for that. And then Jim's back on again, and he says, does the stabilizer model mean that a cross a breed analysis is very possible for the whole industry? So two really good questions. Right. I'm looking we've forward got, to the answer. So you've got one minute each. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, the, um, the cross breed analysis um, is very possible. We're currently generating a cross breed analysis. We have your red Angus, um, Angus Red and Black, Simmental, Gelvie, Charlay, Hereford, um, I probably left out a breed or two, um, that are all being generated in our population right now. Um, and that's, it's a complicated analysis. It requires phenotypes with those animals compared in the same herds. And I think this database is quite unique in providing really good comparisons for that information. And uh, it is working. And uh, the, um, the whole industry obviously is a very broad description. What's whole industry mean? There are breeds that are not in our database, okay? And if you have high percentage animals of breeds that are not in our database, um, it's gonna be hard to connect to them. And if those populations don't have linkages to animals that are in our database, it's complicated. So that, that's how I would answer James's question. I don't know if, Kent, you wanna talk about the F1 heifer and so it's presumably sired by a stabilizer, but out of an unknown breed dam with the, with the analysis work. Yeah, and that um, I think is a precursor to a product we call Inherit Select that's really built from our collaboration with LCOC. Uh, that is the specific purpose of that product, whereby for replacement heifer candidates, um, provided the sire and or the dam heritage is connected to the evaluation, we can take a commercial animal that we know very little about in the way of pedigree or even phenotypes. And uh, we feel like we can produce genetic predictions across the traits that are more accurate than what otherwise would be achieved by pedigree and performance data alone. So I think that's really the future of testing in commercial herds. Um, as long as they're connected, we can get good predictions for those animals and make better decisions from that information. And the nice thing is the database actually tells us if they're connected. So, yeah. so we learn that. We get a prediction with an accuracy and that accuracy tells us how well connected they are. 
And, and regardless of, you know, I, I think the predictions we have at all levels are going to be better. But if an animal is completely unrelated, that prediction is going to come out with a very low accuracy. Yeah. And, that's, you know, and Lee, I would, um, I would also just offer that that commercial product that's available here um, and and in the not too distant future anticipated for the UK, it actually uses genomic information to predict breed composition. So um, from the breeds that are in the stabilizer as well as some um, breeds that might be in that unknown commercial cow, provided we have that as in our, in our reference population, we can predict the uh, breed composition makeup of that tested commercial female. Seth, can I ask one more question before we end? Because I think it's, Very you know, quickly, yeah, we've had these, these questions about the validity and the controversialness of the EBVs. And one of the things that, that when we work with Zoetis, Zoetis obviously sells a lot of different products and they validate all those products. And Kent, could you just talk from the, just the very high level about the initial validation that we've done with these genomic tests and, and how well it predicts the animals under commercial conditions? Oh, you bet. This was a fun project. So we worked with Lee and um, his contacts at Lincoln County Feedlot um, many of Lee's bull customers retain ownership, and then their calves are fed and harvested. And what we did is we had about 700 animals that we took DNA samples from. So we got genetic predictions for uh, carcass merit and the feedlot carcass index based only on genomic information. And then we fed them, harvested them, and we compared the genetic prediction to the actual express performance of those animals. When we do so, we um, split the animals into four genetic groups based on the genomic prediction, and then we compared the performance of the animals. And for all the traits from um, marbling score to ribeye area to fat thickness, and most importantly, the index that is an indicator of the animals that have the best combined genetic merit across those traits, the actual express performance ranked um, just as it was uh, with the genetic predictions. So we really felt good about that. And there's a technical document, Seth, that I can share with you and um, you can post uh, for your readers uh, to, to take a look at. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, you know, the one thing that we've, we've said through all of this is 30 minutes goes really, really quickly <laughs> when we're having fun. And it, it's been fantastic this evening. We are going to call it to an end. But I think what we are going to need to do is we're going to have to definitely get you both back on. And we're going to have to do uh, we're going to have to go into more details on this genomics and, and, and look at it in a bit more detail. But thank you both very much for coming on. If anybody wants to see what the genomics can do. Uh, for them or uh, have a look at them. Our database that is on stabilizer.co.uk now includes the genomics. We've tested a, a big chunk of the active animals in our herd now. Have a look. The data there has got the genomics included. Anybody wants to get any um, testing done, if you've got stabilizer cattle on the farm, as Kent uh, hinted at earlier, 2021, there could be an opportunity to get um, your commercial animals tested to see what sort of figures are on that. But we'll, again, I think we need to have a separate webinar on that one, Kent. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining in this evening. Thank everybody for uh, attending. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks to, to Lee and thanks to Kent. Um, any more information, head over to our website. Um, but thank you very much. And we'll see you next week for EBVs. Thanks, Seth. Uh, thanks, Ursula. Thanks, everyone. Good night.